Hello, everybody. Guess what? I've been out collecting, and not just fungi. I've also been collecting some adjectives. And I'd like to read you a few from my list because they're really rather interesting. It goes like this. Dangerous, deadly, disgusting, revolting, rotten, repulsive, rancid, bad, evil and venomous, vile, toxic, gross and foul, sinister, hideous, horrible, unhealthy, weird and strange, destructive, poisonous, toxic, offensive, noxious, dubious, stupid, useless, harmful, slippery, slimy, filthy, ugly, ghastly, smelly, pesky, scuzzy, sneaky, freaky, dirty, stinky, creepy, idiotic, perverse and untrustworthy. Now, I know I've got an election coming up, <laughs> but I'm not describing politicians, much less appropriately. These are the adjectives used by the general Australian public to describe, you guessed it, fungi, based on a survey I've been doing the last few months. Now, fortunately, sprinkled in amongst those, there's a few more positive ones. There was interesting, cool, fascinating, funky, awesome, whatever that means these days, important and wacko. <laughs> So it seems generally that the Australian public don't think too favourably about fungi. But we must ask, is it any wonder? Because I had a quick look at the Australian Concise Oxford Thesaurus at the synonyms for fungi. And this is what I found. Here we go again, this time in alphabetical order. Affliction, bane, blot on the landscape. Canker, contamination, corruption, curse, decay, dump, evil, eyesore, infestation, glop, goo, gunk. Mildew, mud, muck, mire, mucus, ooze, pest, pestilence, pollution, rot, scourge, scum, sludge, waste, withering and woe. Oh, woe well, indeed. Is it really any wonder that fungi are thought of too favourably? You know, for a long time I thought fungal conservation was about fungi. Well, it's actually, as I just tried to show, it's about other species as well, namely Homo sapiens and, and how we think about fungi. And as an environmental photographer, I've always been... Um, I guess more partial to photographing fungi than people. I find fungi slightly more agreeable generally. But as someone passionately interested in fungal conservation and biodiversity conservation more generally, I realise that it's imperative that we understand people and the relationships they have with fungi and their perceptions of fungi if we are indeed to conserve fungi and biodiversity more generally. So in my talk today, I'd like to look at uh, our three questions. What are the causes of mycomyopia? Are there cures? And how do we embed fungi in Australian biodiversity conservation? Now, I should just add that mycomyopia doesn't mean fungi or cats in need of spectacles. It's just a little wordplay referring to our, our blindness when it comes to including fungi in fungal conservation. Firstly, I'd like to look at what do we already know? What's in the basket, so to speak, in terms of fungal conservation? And then I'll give an overview of where we're currently at with fungal conservation in Australia. And I'm sure many of you will have a pretty good idea of this because you're the ones who are out there looking for fungi, surveying, documenting, setting the records in the fungi map and trying to get the species listed. So I'll make this pretty brief. And from there, I'd like to look at what we, what we don't know and what we need to know. But in particular, what can we do to increase the profile of and public interest in fungi? So, a very kind slime mob, perhaps a Steminitis, has given us a map of Australia that I'll be using. You can see there's some degree of um, continental drift here, Tasmania's head of south. Most of Victoria seems to be inundated, including Rawson. And in, uh, if any of you are thinking of crossing the Nullarbor, do proceed with caution because there's a large unidentified diptrin just east of uh, Euclid there. So, at the moment, we've got 11,846 species of fungi, including just over 3,500 lichens. Now, this was based on Chapman's 2009 paper. We're probably actually nudging up somewhere closer to about 15,000 species at the moment. Um, we've also got a high diversity of plants in Australia, somewhere around about 25,000 species. So given the high incidence of symbioses between fungi and plants, as well as the huge diversity of substrates and habitat types, we'd expect to see an accompanying high diversity of fungi. Now, there's been some absolutely wonderful achievement, achievements in Australian fungal conservation over the last 30 years, and I'd just like to work through these briefly. So starting with legislative listings, and getting species listed is still a major driver of conservation, particularly conservation funding, as we've seen for flora and fauna. So getting fungi listed on the various pieces of state legislation and national legislation is a very important first step 
for their protection. To date, there's been about 17 species listed in two communities under the various pieces of state legislation, the first being Hobocryopsis amplectans under the FFG in Victoria. So we also have got the interactive catalogue of Australian fungi. Uh, this has just been updated as part of the Atlas of Living Australia. This started in the 1980s, but will also continue alongside the ALA. The ALA, which Aline has already um, mentioned, we've got, what is it, almost 100,000 species, oh, 100,000 species, uh, records from fungi map, and many of those have been migrated across already. And the ALA also provides information on all known Australian species and really improves public access to biodiversity information. We've got the Fungi of Australia book series, and so far there's been uh, Smut Fungi Septoria and Hygrophoraceae, uh, Hypophoraceae documented, and uh, lichens have been pretty well covered in five volumes, although rather inappropriately as part of the Plants of Australia series. Fungi map, I'm sure you've all heard of fungi map. <laughs> I won't go into, again, into too much detail about that as um, Alina already took us through that, other than to say it really is a vital hub of interconnectivity between professional mycologists, enthusiasts, field naturalists, and anyone with an interest in fungi. Fungi Bank, this was an initiative of the CSIRO, a national Australian government body for scientific research, and it provides information on the importance and benefits of native fungi in the management and restoration of landscapes. We've also got the Australian National Botanic Gardens, the ANBG Australian Fungi website, and this documents the history, the ecology, the taxonomy, and many other aspects of Australian fungi. Across in the west, we've got Forest Check, um, which is a monitoring project that provides information about trends in biodiversity, including fungi associated with forest activities in West Australia's Jarrah forests. And it aims to evaluate the relationship of fungal biodiversity to forest disturbance, as well as to advise on fungal pathology in southwestern forests. There's a couple of fantastic projects that came out of uh, the Bot Gardens in Melbourne. The first one was a travelling exhibition called Hidden in Plain View. Uh, of cryptogams, and that was shown in nine galleries across four states, and it was visited by 80,000 people. So I'm wondering why are those 80,000 people all here and involved in fungi map, or even 79,000? So how are we going to get this message across to the public to get more people involved in fungi? There's also the Australian Australasian Mycological Society that was formed in 1993 and has a fungal conservation special interest group. And at a national level in 2000, international level, sorry, in 2011, the International Society for Fungal Conservation was formed, which is the only society in the world specifically dedicated to fungal conservation. And they have a conference later this year in Turkey for anyone who might like to come along. And lastly, but not least, is the Lane Cove Bushland Park. And I've popped this one up because it's the first reserve in Australia dedicated or made a reserve to protect fungi, a, com a community of hygrosibi um, was the reason this uh, parkland, this park was established. So you'll see here there's been quite a remarkable list of achievements in the last 30 years. However, the question still remains, are fungi actually still being, are they actually being adequately protected in Australia? As a um, Michigan as Sapphire said, it's still largely unknown, for example, if rare and threatened fungal species do exist, and if so, whether current conservation measures, particularly surrogacy approaches, are sufficient for their protection. And given the high incidence of symbiosis between not just with plants but also with animals and the documented threats to those groups, it's likely that fungi will be similarly at risk. So what are the main ongoing challenges to fungal conservation? Let's firstly have a quick look at legislation. Now, most of you will know our key piece of environmental legislation is the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act of 1999. Now, of the 2,000 species of flora and fauna listed under that act, there's not one single fungus species there. So, yet probably every one of those uh, species of flora and fauna on there, in some way, either directly or indirectly, are linked to fungi, and yet no fungi have actually been listed. There's also currently no Australian red list. Some states do have red lists, but with varying um, compliance with the IUC and the International Union for the Conservation of Nature criteria. Now, we do have biodiversity strategies at both state and federal levels. 
However, fungi are very rarely included in that. I'd like to look very briefly at national parks because they're still very much a cornerstone of conservation in Australia. We have uh, over 9,000 areas protected, either is, is under some level of protection, comprising 11.5% of the country's area. However, fungi have not been properly recognised in virtually any of the management plans of these parks. And I recently examined um, 40 national park management plans across all states and territories. They're all written over <coughs> the last 25 years with a quarter in the last five years. And this is what I found. Over 30% made no reference to fungi. Now, I just went through that great long list of things that have happened in the last 30 years, and yet we're still writing management plans. And the idea of a management plan is to, to, protect, well, to provide many things. It's about managing tourism, about managing roads, but it's also about managing biodiversity in those parks. And yet 30% didn't even use the word fungus or fungi or mycota or any species name anywhere within the management plan. I just had a quick look at the Mount Borbor one and there's two references to fungi. Well, actually not to fungi, they're both to Phytophthora. So fungus like organism, but fungi aren't mentioned in terms of their importance. And that was written in 2005. So it's a relatively recent one and yet fungi still didn't come up as part of biodiversity. Uh, of those that did mention fungi, 91% made reference to fungi as pathogenic or in some way problematic, as a, an agent causing disease. And certainly we do have many problematic fungal species, but we also have this great other suite of fungi that perhaps require protection. <coughs> and there just seemed to be a general lack of understanding about fungi in those ones that did mention fungi, often they were listed as plants. And um, I think Phytophthora was listed as one as a slime mould <laughs> in one of those reports. And often you had the feeling that the word fungi was thrown in as an afterthought rather than being actively included as an important part of biodiversity. So despite the uh, aforementioned increases in knowledge and interest since the 1980s, it's frustrating to acknowledge that there's been negligible effect in influencing governments and policymakers to endorse fungi in biodiversity conservation. So why? Why is that? Why has the significance of fungi not been recognised and why have recommendations been ignored? Well, that's exactly what I've been endeavouring to find out by actually going in talking to biodiversity managers, talking to policy makers, as well as those working on the ground, doing the surveys to find out why they're not actually surveying fungi as well. Now, oh sorry, that's also one thing I wanted to add. From these 40 management plans, on average, there's 109 references to flora, 83 to fauna, but less than one reference on average to fungi in those management plans. So, going back to my, um, who was I? Uh, actually, I'll come back to that. Let me be there for a moment. So, can conservationists, field naturalists, enthusiasts, you people here today, can we actually do enough to document and protect and hold possible species and habitat <coughs> loss? Or do we need to look at potential ways to catalyse the process to explore perhaps the issues from other perspectives? And perhaps the pertinent question is, what else do we need to know? But a second question that's less often asked is, what are the ways of knowing? And is knowledge alone enough? Do we need to explore other ways of knowing? For example, via a thesis. That is, ways to connect with fungi, with the environment, through multiple senses, through direct contact, to capture not just minds, but hearts as well. That is, simply getting more people out in the bush. And I'm going to come back to this in a moment. But can all the knowledge we need to progress fungal conservation come from mycologists alone? Certainly, we need more expertise. We need more taxonomic and distribution data. We need to know more about our threat status. But conservation requires not just mycological expertise, but also public support. What do we actually know about the ways in which fungi are valued? We saw some of the negative ways before with those adjectives, but what are the positive ways in which people value fungi? I guess these could be essentially called the cultural values. Something we might also consider is how does fungal conservation adopt a more critical and inclusive approach to its role in society? And how do we embed social and ethical values into fungal conservation? Why do so many Australians not like fungi? How do we arouse an empathic imagination that could erode these destructive belief systems that lead to all these nasty adjectives that I found? Is this guy perhaps... Oh, I've lost someone in there. 
That's all right. Um, so, where did I get to? I'm always quite surprised when I talk to people in various workshops I've been running that uh, how deeply embedded negative mythologies and ideologies still are today about fungi. I'm wondering, how do we actually dissipate those and let the wonderment and the realities of the signs actually surpass the mythologies and the, ideo and the ideologies? And perhaps we can begin by looking at um, other marginalised groups of organisms. So very little research has been done on human attitudes to fungi, but various studies have been done on perceptions of other groups of organisms. And it might be useful to make a quick comparison um, with invertebrates as a way, as well as to have a look at other approaches uh, from other countries to fungal conservation. Incidentally, 72 invertebrates have been listed under the Flora and Fauna Guarantee. And I was talking to a chap the other day who's been 30 years working in invertebrate conservation. And um, I asked him, I said, Dave, why has there been millions, if not tens of millions, been spent on documenting invertebrates in Victoria? And he said to me, it was when we realised that they were such important indicator species. And I was thinking that's a, a good thing to look at in fungal conservation as well. So various uh, studies have been... Um, have assessed public attitudes towards invertebrates, for example, as a means of determining potential flagship species. And attraction to flagship species often relates to various combinations of cultural, education and economic factors, and hence flagship species can be selected to resonate with specific target groups. In summary, positive attitudes towards invertebrates mainly come from either their aesthetic attraction, the utilitarian value, or their ecological function. Now, aesthetic attraction was found to relate to factors including <coughs> colour, size, and perceptions of attractiveness. Understanding public preferences toward fungi, including the origins of the negative uh, perceptions, could really assist in their public promotion. For example, the genus Hybrosybia, they're brightly coloured, they're delicate, and they appear to generally be accepted uh, to be considered as attractive. And while I don't want to confuse the designation of flagship species with those that are requiring legislative protection, we still need to recognise that greater challenges may exist in communicating the importance of those species that are perhaps less conspicuous or considered less attractive. However, every fungus species has its own story and often it's quite a fascinating one, particularly in relation to their interconnections with other organisms. And this could be into incorporated into the choice of flagships in the case of fungi, it's perhaps this quality of bizarreness, such as invertebrate parasitism or luminosity or the curious morphologies, that could perhaps be more effectively promoted to increase interest in fungi. Invertebrate studies also showed that the perception um, of their ecological value was closely linked to, eco uh, to educational levels while the greater recognition of their utilitarian values was reported among people actually living in close proximity to invertebrates, demonstrating the importance not just of local knowledge, but direct contact with invertebrates. So I just wanted to quickly give you um, a summary of where we are currently in Australia. And this is our list, uh, list of um, listed fungal species. So in New South Wales, we've got 10 species listed. In Victoria, we've got three hypocropsis and plectins and two lichen species, and we've got four across in the west. The second thing I wanted to have a look at is the number of action plans for those listed species. So we've got 17 species listed, but only two have action plans. So it's one thing to get them listed, but we've got to go that next step and actually write an action plan as to how to manage for those species. And this is part of the problem. This is the list of macrofungal mycologists employed in herbaria. We've got one here in Victoria and a fly in the middle here. You can see it's a big job, and this is not including a number of you are honoraries or retired or students or contributing in some way, but I'm talking about what the government has actually employed um, in terms of macrofungal mycologists employed in her barrier. So, um, invertebrates, that's one way of looking at how they're being managed. Another way is actually to look at what's happening overseas in fungal conservation. I've had a quick look at Europe, and... As in Australia, most of the advances in fungal conservation in Europe have actually happened uh, since the 1980s. Now, oh, yes, what slide is going to avoid this? Invertebrates, sorry. 
So here's the map of Europe. You can see it's probably not the same one that you're familiar with, but the borders change all the time in Europe, so this will be quite different tomorrow. Um, so at the moment, 31 countries in Europe have red lists. And on those red lists, there's at least 5,500 species listed at least in one country. So while that's quite alarming that so many species are requiring protection are on a red list, it's incredible to acknowledge they know that much about their fungi that they can be listed. However, fungi are not included in the Berne Convention or any other European legislation. In fact, the aim, one of the aims of the Berne Convention was to protect wild species of plants or animals, so fungi weren't actually explicitly mentioned there. Um, now, there are also there are action plans for listed species in many countries, including the Czech Republic, Estonia, Finland, Poland, Sweden and the UK. And these action plans include information on mapping, on monitoring and even efforts to subsidise landowners for specific management actions. Other advancements include community monitoring and engagement programs, not as good as fungi map though, uh, the trialling of macrofungi as indicators of environmental health, especially in grasslands. And several countries, including the UK and the Netherlands, have published assessments of areas important for fungal biodiversity and have developed management plans, management guidelines specifically for fungi. However, while this is sounding very pos positive, there was a, a report recently by Dave Minter of the International Society for Fungal Conservation. Some of you might have seen this, and he had a look at the 44 signatories of the Berne Convention, uh, sorry, the Convention of Biological Diversity. So to be a signatory to this convention, you have to produce a biodiversity management plan. And um, what he found is that 75% of those signatories still don't recognise the importance of fungi in biodiversity conservation. So it's really rather a sad and sorry situation, both in Australia, but also internationally. And the immense... Uh, Efforts of scientists advocating for biodiversity conservation have really revealed the incredible complexities of the planet and provided us with an amazing uh, baseline of data, of information. But how do we meld this knowledge with the great spectrum of other ways in which the world and biodiversity, including fungi, are translated, understood and valued? How do we incorporate the effective dimension of fungal conservation? For example, what Ed Wilson referred to as biophilia, or simply the fundamental human need to interact with nature in an other than cognitive way, to re-enchant our relationship with nature, with fungi. And passion for the environment is arguably as important as knowledge in driving biodiversity conservation. And a more integrated and conceptually sensitive approach to environmental issues that balances knowledge and passion could provide new lenses, new vocabularies and new contexts from which to reconsider our existence within the biosphere, including our interactions with fungi. Perhaps it simply relies on getting more people back to the dirt. Can effective decisions about conservation really be made from the air-conditioned offices of Canberra? I mean, how many policymakers or politicians have actually lain on their backs and peered into the perfect underbelly of a hygrophorus? How many have stroked a griffler or smelt a lapista? Is cognitive knowing really enough? Concepts such as biodiversity or species extinction or global warming or simply valuing nature remain all the more abstract when they're removed from the senses. We also need to understand these concepts sensorially. An American writer, Aldo Leopold, who is followed by a long tradition of writers and thinkers and naturalists who espoused an empathic approach to nature. And it's arguably impossible to create empathy without sensorial experience. Aesthesis or sensation lies at the very core of embodied experience. Thanks. To wrap up, poor public understanding of fungi and the various cultural aversions means that they're fairly unlikely to attract attention and concern in their own right. One might then question how can we make the great leap to insert arguments about the value of fungi into the public forum? The key to arousing public interest in fungi perhaps relies on elucidating the connections between the conservation of fungi and the well-being of humanity. And by connecting humanity with fungi, the issue becomes one not just of conservation of fungi, 
but also of humanity, indeed the rest of biodiversity. And I'd just like to end on a wee poem. It's called Hypocryopsis Goes Missing. And it goes like this. A young gregarious Cortinarius was having a worrisome day when Lepiota, in her new Toyota, just happened to pass her way. You're looking troubled. Your cap is furrowed. How can I help you? Oh, Hypocryopsis has disappeared without a sign or clue. Oh dear, that's awful. We must take action. I'll round up the troops. Within a flash, they all arrived, a keen and able group. I'll ask my sister, said Lepista. She'll know just what to do. And Clavulina might have seen her. We must check with her too, said Lactarius. I'm sure there's various ways to track her down, said Biasparella, dressed in yellow. I'll alert them all in town, said Claveria. I'll search this area and you go over there and ask old Conk, for he sees all. I'm sure he'll notice where. Yes, said Sterium, let me query him. He's always got a plan. And Ammonita might just sight her and do whatever he can. Then Pycnoporus joined the chorus to lend a helping paw. Then even more mushrooms arrived and more and more and more. You know she's listed, said Lepista. She's really rather rare. Not that all those homo sapiens always seem to care. What could be scarier, said Lucaria, than slipping from this planet? We must take action. We must do something. Let's just do it, damn it. All day they searched, cried out and called, but she was nowhere to be found. They looked on branches high and low, and those right on the ground. As darkness fell, tired and weary, they assembled by the log, and the mist swirled round, and the moon stayed low as they shivered in the fog. The mood was grim, their hearts were low, as they shuddered in the gloom, and spirits sank as the night owl woke and sang its mournful tune. And finally, the moment came for the message from Pitsiza, who cleared her throat and sadly said, they found her on a pizza. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Alison. We have time for two questions before lunch. Um, Alison, I was very inspired by that and I'm, I feel compelled to make a comment. Uh, to, to me, I just, there are two people in this room responsible for the nomination of the hypocryopsis. It's meant to be a confidential process, so I don't know whether those two people are happy for it to be made public. But actually, nothing.